Was Brexit inevitable? Was Theresa May a victim of poor decisions or impossible problems? And what is Boris Johnson's strategy and will it work? These are among the topics addressed in this episode of the Irish Economics Podcast. Welcome to episode two of the Irish Economics Podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by Professor Edgar Morganroth, full professor of economics at DCU Business School. Today, we're going to talk about Brexit, focusing on the strategy behind the decision making. So the main question here is, can we understand why past decisions were made? But also, can we give insight into what is motivating current decisions and use this insight to identify the likely outcome of negotiations over the coming months? So with that in mind, I suppose the place to begin is with the 2016 Brexit referendum. And it was widely believed that the Brexit vote was an attempt by David Cameron to put an end to a rising anti-EU sentiment within the Conservative Party. So, so I, I suppose the first question here is, was there a better way to handle this sentiment? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, firstly, maybe one could go back a little bit further. Uh, ultimately, there has been there have been several decades of Euroscepticism in the UK. And there's been very little of proper information uh, that sort of tries to counter that uh, Euroscepticism. And at the at the time when David Cameron made this uh, sort of promise that there would be a referendum if he uh, was re-elected with a majority, uh, he was fearful not just of some of the people within his own party who were pushing the Brexit agenda, but also UKIP. And uh, I think he at the time thought that UKIP would take some seats from the Conservative Party if he didn't make that promise. Sure. Of course, at that point, it didn't look very likely that he would win uh, this this election anyway. Yeah. And so it was a bit of a surprise when he did come in with a, with a majority. Uh, and and uh, that then meant he, he would either have to uh, renege on his promise or actually go through with it. And he decided to go uh, through with it. An alternative to the referendum would have been to counter the Brexiteer arguments with facts. Yes. Uh, and very few people attempt to do that. That includes the academic community, uh, and, and of which I am one. Uh, economists were fairly silent on all sorts of Eurosceptic uh, uh, propaganda that you could read in some of the, the, the papers. Uh, so that would have been the alternative to holding the referendum, simply to actually counter the argument. Maybe... Could it be said that Cameron may have panicked a little? I suppose one theory I have is that the first pass the post system might have distorted incentives. The first pass the post system should normally make uh, finding a majority more easy. Uh, if you think of the Irish system, which is a very much a proportional system, uh, there have been coalitions for for for, for very many many decades, and uh, it's really not expected to find an absolute majority for one party. In the UK, that's possible, uh, but what has happened is that. Uh, that opinions have polarised and parties have polarised and new parties have also emerged, like UKIP or now the Brexit party, sure. party that if every one of those parties just gets a few seats, the arithmetic becomes very, very difficult, even in a first-past-the-post system. And, and I think that's where we are now. And of course, the biggest issue for the Conservative Party is that it's internally split. And on top of that, we have a Labour Party that is also internally yeah. split. So finding any kind of majority uh, when the two largest parties can't even find uh, any kind of agreed position is almost impossible. And it would appear then that the focus has moved away from the target objective of serving the people and the sort of incentives towards serving the needs of the party. Yes, and I think at this stage we're, we're very much uh, faced with a situation where the the, the debate is very inward facing. It's it's largely, uh, you know, how does a diff, uh, each group get what they want within Britain? Uh, uh, for many, and that includes Theresa May when she was uh, prime minister, uh, it seemed that. 
the party was more important than the country mm-hmm. and the country was more important than getting a deal. And uh, it's it, in, in that sense, you know, maybe the negotiations were doomed to failure anyway because the UK is so divided. So you, you mentioned Theresa May. So there's two frames of thought, I suppose, when it comes to Theresa May and, and, and her tenure. Many people say that she made a lot of strategic errors, but... She's also faced with a situation where there's this problem to solve, but there's so many different constraints that it's very hard to find a solution that would give you the outcome that they wanted. I think her approach uh, was extremely flawed. Um, So before triggering Article 50, it would have been useful to actually trash out an agreed position that the House of Commons could support. Uh, And failing to do that, she was negotiating on her own without the support of the parliament. We know where that ended up. Uh, we, we've had uh, so many votes on the withdrawal agreement and everything around it. Yeah. And, you know, the parliament uh, wants their cake. They they want to eat it as well. And they want another one or two in spare. Um, so it, it's impossible to negotiate when you're, when you're not sure. And indeed... Uh, even a year ago, I questioned, uh, certainly on Twitter, uh, whether it was worth negotiating with her at all, because it didn't look likely that any deal that she could come back with would find the support of the parliament. Yeah. So that was the first po- problem that uh, I think she she uh, made a mistake on. She should have gotten an agreed position and only then uh, triggered the Article 50 negotiations. The second a very big mistake she made is to start negotiating uh, with the EU in a very confrontative way, uh, rather than saying, look, you know, we have a democratic uh, outcome here from a referendum. We're going to try and do this as amicably as possible. Uh, instead, we had talk of war cabinets and things like that. And we're not paying any, uh, you know, f- the, the Brexit bill that we don't have any liability, you can't force us and so on. So it was always a confrontation. So that meant that the EU was going to approach this in a very structured, very uh, planned and and quite rigid way. Yeah. Uh, whereas if there had been goodwill from the UK from the start, there might have been ways of, of smoothing over some of the hurdles uh, because there would have been trust. But when you go in uh, and basically deny everything, argue over every little thing, the trust goes very quickly and you can't then say, well, okay, we'll sort it out later or whatever. Uh, You then have to go and sort everything out up front and put it in writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that was another mistake that she made. And and I think she probably wasn't wise in in the way she chose her various cabinet ministers. And there have been so many many ministers coming and going, actually. I lose track of who is actually in power now, uh, who's who's in in the different ministries. that hasn't helped for sure. You want to find a grey area that you need to, in order to find a, a compromise that you need a grey area and that sort of dealing in absolutes just really is not a good strategy. That that may be another issue with, with her uh, that I don't think she quite understood. And I think many, many uh, UK uh, ministers didn't and still don't understand that this isn't really diplomacy. Uh, this ultimately is something that has to be legally binding and precise. Yeah. So you can't fudge things. So if the UK wants to do trade deals with third countries and they involve maybe letting chlorinated chicken into the UK, yeah. then we have, as the EU, have to have certainty as to whether we let that stuff into the EU or not. Sure. And chlor- chlorinated chicken is not allowed to circulate in the EU. So you immediately have an issue. So it's very, very precise and not open to grey areas and fudging. Of course, diplomats like fudging and they like getting a deal. But this has to be precise. And I think that was misunderstood in, on the British side. And, and actually, I think on, on, uh, on the EU side by, by some uh, uh, politicians in various countries as well who thought that there would, 
be some way of, of doing this. That is the reason why trade negotiations always take very long, yeah. because they're very precise. And CETA, for example, the Canada-Europe trade agreement, something like seven years, it's a text of 1,100 pages, mm -hmm. very, very precise, with lots and lots of exemptions that were all negotiated one by one and that are precise and legally binding. And of course, then the whole Northern Ireland situation adds another layer of complexity onto that, where we have we, ha we have an agreement that uh, works because of a lack of precision, I suppose. And of course, the Good Friday Agreement wasn't uh, a, a trade agreement. Uh, sure. It would have looked very different if it was. Yeah. Uh, and so allowed that, that type of agreement allows for these grey areas. And now we're going to, to, to put a new agreement in place that interacts with this and it's going to going to change things yeah. potentially uh, and that's the, the the purpose of the backstop is to avoid any changes that are material to the border which would undermine the the good friday agreement okay so perhaps we can move on to discussing the current state of play and the decision making facing boris johnson so in order to understand Boris's decision making, I suppose the first thing is to understand well what motivates his decision making. And I can see three potential drivers behind Boris's decisions. First of all, doing what's best for the UK. Secondly, doing what's best for the Conservatives. Thirdly, doing what's best for Boris. So I wonder on which side of these decisions he lies. In, in my mind, it, it would be leaning towards Boris. Well, I think in, in terms of, of priorities, I'm, I'm fairly sure that Boris puts himself first, uh, yeah. the party second and the country third. Um, I, I think that that's the case with many politicians. Um, I think at the moment, it is an extremely difficult to read situation because uh, of what has happened over the last few days. And it is very fluid situation. So, uh, you know, in, in a day's time, the, the situation may already have changed a little bit. Absolutely. But what appears to be happening is that that uh, Boris uh, is trying to avoid uh, their legislation being passed by the parliament that would stop a no deal Brexit. Uh, there is a majority, and we knew this back in March and indeed in February, there is a majority in the House of Commons to leave with a deal. So yes. the majority does not want to leave without a deal. Uh, and of course, Boris has continuously said that if needs be, uh, they will leave without a deal. And that is the threat that he is trying to push the EU with. And uh, if the parliament took the threat off the table, then he would be left with pretty much nothing. Okay. So that is one interpretation of what's going on. So basically, on. it's it's a move to strengthen his position with EU negotiations. And that if, if, if it's deal versus no deal... we yeah, need to make a, a better that, deal. That, that, that is one interpretation. Now, I'm not sure that the EU is going to be pushed by any of this. And I think I'm pretty sure that they're not. I think he's bluffing anyway, and he wants to keep his bluff up. And the bluff would be gone if the parliament decided that there would be a deal. Uh, now, the parliament can decide all kinds of things. That doesn't mean it's going to happen because, of course, the European side has to agree with whatever is going to come along. And the European side could easily say, 31st of October, no extension, that's it out. Um, and in fact, I have been in favour of and, and, and tried, tried to make a little bit of noise around this back in February, that given that the majority in the House of Commons want to leave with a deal, there is a deal, a deal uh, there. If you put enough pressure on them that they have to choose between this deal and no deal, they will vote for this deal. But by agreeing for the extension, they didn't have to make that choice. And that is what I worry. And we would cut, we could have a, a kind of a never ending nightmare uh, with this, with this uh, uh, process if we keep on extending in the hope that somehow or another they're going to sort themselves out, which I'm not sure is going to happen. There is another possible strategy that 
Boris Johnson is pursuing, and that is to to force a confidence vote yeah. and get an election that way. And that's what some people are arguing. Again, I don't quite follow this because the chances of him re- returning with an absolute majority, I think, are smaller yeah. than they were before because the Brexit party is likely to take some seats. The Lib Dems will take some seats. Uh, what happens to Labour isn't exactly clear. There is a possibility that whatever gains the Conservatives have made in Scotland in the last election, they would lose again. Yeah. Uh, and even in Northern Ireland, the DUP might be down a seat or two as well. So the chances of a majority for Boris, yeah. I think, actually smaller with an election. So I, I'm not sure that I follow that strategy either. I think he's in a in a very difficult position. He backed himself into a corner uh, by saying 31st of October is it with or without a deal. Uh, and we're not willing to put anything forward that is going to get us to a deal. Uh, so he's essentially not negotiating on the one hand and he has nothing to negotiate with. Yeah. On the other hand, he 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 is saying well we should we, you know we want a deal he he he's kind of left out, you know i don't think he has any cards left i suppose it is it's a game of poker in that he has to pretend he has all the cards but he knows deep down that the house of commons will not accept no deal so he can afford to be bullish without having to incur the costs that usually come with that but you end up running out of time, and that's what he's trying to do. He's run, uh, running down the clock, uh, and uh, there was always I, I've always had this fear that that is exactly what the UK would do. They would run down the clock. Um, the the border issue is not solvable. Um, if the UK insists on their red lines, it's not solvable. Uh, that there is no solution. So. In that scenario, the, the, the strategy is to run down the clock and hope that somehow or another the EU line splinters and that, that Ireland is basically sacrificed. Right, okay. And I don't think that's going to happen uh, because the EU at this stage has invested uh, a lot in this and, and in, in holding the Irish position. Uh, and it's also something that other uh, EU member states, smaller member states, will be watching. You know, if a if a small member state uh, is threatened uh, uh, significantly by some decision that is taken at the central level, and there is no regard for it, I think that sets a very bad precedent. And again, I think in Brussels, one is keenly aware that uh, they don't want to set that kind of precedent. So the EU position is unlikely to change. Yeah. So you you know so he's running down the time basically to let he, so the EU will, will act first and maybe sacrifice Ireland. That's his, that that's that's the end, end game in that regard. Okay. It is a, it is not a, a solvable problem. Uh you can't have both uh uh you know leaving the customs union and the single market and then have an open border. It is not possible. The members of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, Lib Dems, etc., they all have a focus now on stopping a no-deal Brexit. That's where all their energy is going in. They're putting together uh, some sort of a rebel alliance, as they're calling it, to try and stop this no-deal Brexit from happening. But that means they're putting no effort into stop into planning for a general election. And there's a lot of talk about a potential general election and that Boris is motivated by winning a general election. So I just wonder how this fits into the whole narrative. That would would imply that the Tories are preparing for an election and I'm not sure that they're uh, they're uh, doing that either because they seem to be internally uh, so divided uh, that uh, you know I I think they're 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 equally uh, absorbed with the with the Brexit issue. Um, so I, I'm not sure that the Tories are having any advantage in this. I think that, that all parties are very much absorbed with Brexit and okay. not really preparing for an election. If there is an election, it will be all about Brexit anyway. Yeah. Uh, so maybe maybe sticking with the Brexit topic is is a is a relatively low risk uh, strategy for all the parties anyway. So one other 
thought on that is that with his hardline strategy, he seems to be consolidating the hardline Brexiteers behind him, which could help him when it comes to an election or whatever, or in terms of the Brexit strategy. Whereas he seems to be fragmenting the anti-Brexiteers. But it seems that the numbers of hardline Brexiteers don't make up a majority. And this is the problem. There is no majority for anything. Uh, And with something like that, I would have thought going back to the people with a referendum would have been the way out. Yeah. But that seems to be the bit that almost everyone has been has been dismissing. And certainly on the Tory side, yeah. uh, that might have been the simplest way to get out of this bind, uh, because ultimately the, 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 the present situation is going to damage democracy within the UK. And by, yeah. by doing what he's doing currently, uh, you know, suspending uh, parliament, uh, you know, this is the sort of stuff that you would have seen in 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 sort of fascist regimes. You know, that is is an amazing uh, uh, development to to think that that parliament is essentially shut down to to facilitate something or to prevent something yeah. democratic from happening. Because if there's a majority in the House of Parliament, it is democratic. So perhaps next we can turn to Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy is an interesting character in that he's anti-EU, if you believe some of the signals he's given in the past, and would probably like to see Brexit passed. I wonder, he, like he is in a difficult position, but what would be his best strategy going forward? Yeah, I, I always thought that his optimal outcome would be a Brexit delivered by the Tories that goes in some way wrong yeah. and delivers an election that he would win. Yes. Um, I'm not sure that that quite such a scenario is on offer. And and that's why he is now considering different options. But ultimately, he wants to become prime minister. Uh, and uh, that that seems to be what he is trying to do. And that then makes it less likely that you could form a cross-party or cross-interest uh, uh, government in the House of Commons uh, because there would be some Tories that are Remainers uh, who would be suspicious of him, uh, you know, as a, you know, some kind of a power grab. Mm. I think that would be the same in with some Lib Dems. Uh, they would worry about it. And of course, even... Uh, the likes of the SNP uh, or, or the, the Welsh, uh, who have been competing traditionally with Labour, would be electorally very suspicious of Corbyn. So it is kind of a perfect storm in terms of the, the sort of makeup of the the Parliament in Westminster and the leaders that are present at the moment. Uh, it it makes the worst possible outcome so much more likely, unfortunately. If you had someone like uh, Tony Blair there, uh, it would have been a hell of a lot easier for some of the Conservatives to say, "Okay, well, we'll go with this guy because he wasn't quite so far from them anyway. But Corbyn, of course, is quite a distance from uh, uh, the the, the sort of even more moderate Tories. So I think that would be quite difficult for them to, to swallow that one. Yeah, absolutely. There was that uh, proposal, of course, where it would be a cross-party effort to try and stop uh, No Deal Brexit, which would not have Jeremy Corbyn as head, but have somebody who would be more palatable on Labour and Conservative sides. But I wonder, is that something that he would go for? Well, he is the leader of the Labour Party. So uh, for him to be sort of sidelined like that, I, I think uh, his pride wouldn't swallow that one. And, yeah. and I think he wouldn't go with it. So coming up with alternative names like Ken Clark, uh, I don't think he would go for it. Uh, it. It's his way or no way. And that seems to have been very much what we've, what we've seen from, from Corbyn. And and his way, unfortunately, is does include a Brexit. And mm-hmm. so I think his strategy, well, his optimal outcome is still that the Tories deliver Brexit. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, and, and hopefully screw up in, in, in some way. OK, so the final player then in the whole Brexit uh, negotiation is the EU. And more recently, the EU have come out 
and have acknowledged that a no-deal Brexit is becoming increasingly more likely. And this seems like the perfect foil to Boris Johnson's approach. Boris Johnson is taking the hardline approach, saying, you know, it's no deal or a better deal, and which is trying to spook the EU. But if the EU are coming out and saying, well, you know what, a no deal is not necessarily, you know, we're getting ready for a no deal. Well, it seems like this is the perfect way to undermine his argument. A no deal is more damaging to the UK than to the EU. Yes, exactly. Uh, and by quite a margin. So uh, this this is why the bluff of a no deal, I think, isn't going to work. You know, if you say, well, I'm going to I'm going to shoot myself in the leg and you might possibly get splattered with a little bit of blood. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're going to do it. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So that that is the kind of bluff he's he's playing, and it just doesn't. It, I don't think it's going to going to make the EU change uh, their approach. Yeah. Ultimately, they have played this very straight. Uh, I was surprised when when Barnier went for went with the uh, all UK backstop option. I think that was one step too far. Yeah. Uh, other than that, pretty much everything that has come out of the negotiations was pretty much uh, uh, foreseeable. There was nothing unusual. Uh, the EU is the larger partner in the negotiations by, again, a long margin. The UK is the, the small one. And in these kind of negotiations, the large one usually gets the bulk of what they want. Yeah. And. The EU has done this in trade negotiations previously. Uh, It's well known they're not going to take a different approach. Uh, So they have done it pretty pretty smartly, pretty predictably. Uh, I think there have been a few mistakes made, um, partly I think possibly by by Ireland actually, in that uh, moving on to phase two of the, the, the negotiations was done on the back of the backstop that was part of the report that was published, I think, in November or December in 2017. And, of course, the the, the backstop is a clever uh, insurance policy. The problem with that report, though, is that it's not legally binding. And so we hear uh, Simon Coveney, for example, uh, uh, now... um, talking about the UK reneging on their commitments, but these commitments were never binding. Mm. And as such, there were always there was always that chance that they would renege on them. Right. And and the Irish government and the EU bought those commitments, knowing that they could be backed out of. So I, I think at the time it would have been better to uh, try and craft something that would have been legally binding. And I think that would have moved the whole thing on a bit further. Yeah. Uh, the, as I said earlier, the UK always, to me, had that strategy to run the clock down, get an agreement at the very last minute, uh, and and Ireland and the Irish border issue would just be, uh, uh, you know, that would be the sacrifice that the EU would make. Uh, that could have been... That, that strategy could have been absolutely stopped at that point in time. We're not moving to phase two until we have something legally binding. Yeah. Uh, so that was, I think, possibly a mistake. And I think not pushing the House of Commons uh, at the end of, of March to that choice, this agreement or out at that point yeah. was another mistake. Again, I think we could have had an agreement at that time. Yeah. And I, I again, I highlighted it at the time, what would be the outcome of the extension? It was always more like more likely that May would be going and would be replaced by Boris Johnson. I think it was easier uh, to do business with Theresa May. Okay, so maybe we can sum up this section by maybe thinking about what these strategies are, maybe summarising them uh, and trying to see what might be coming down the line. Um, okay, we start with Boris then. As we said, he wants a better deal and he's willing to leave with no deal in order to make this claim stronger. He's blocking the House of Commons to try and make this uh, a stronger case. In order to get his better deal, he's relying on the EU and Ireland to cave in. And as we've discussed, 
it's going to be quite difficult for the EU and Ireland to cave in. It's quite unlikely that they'll cave in. So then, what's the likely outcome? Well, to avoid a no deal, I suppose one of two things needs to happen. Number one, Boris needs to back down, and this seems like a politically very difficult thing for him to do. Secondly, the rest of the Commons need to save the UK from no deal. But of course, this is becoming increasingly more difficult. Uh, the only way I can see that we're going to get uh, a deal is that if this deal is pushed through, con- you know, with rigorously without any kind of um, kind of trying to make changes, uh, there are no alternative arrangements that. And there cannot be any alternative arrangements that deal with the border issue. Uh, you know, it's up to the UK to find such 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 uh, uh, arrangements. But you know, we, we now call that chasing unicorns. Uh, you know, ultimately these don't exist. Uh, Trust the trader scheme. What does that mean? Well, we already have that in place, actually. Uh, the issue around borders is not about the legal trade, the above board trade. It's about the illegal trade. And a trusted trader scheme or, or technology that does uh, number plate recognition isn't capable of looking inside the trucks and see what's in them. Yeah. And and that is ultimately the problem. And even if we had that, the nature and the status of the border would have changed, which is politically important. It's politically important, particularly for the nationalist side in Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. And the escalation uh, of violence in Northern Ireland that we have seen over recent months, I think is directly attributable to uh, this whole Brexit issue and the threat to the border. Um, you know, uh, we don't see widespread uh, support for this, but some of these more radical elements... Uh, that some of us had thought or hoped had gone away, they're re-emerging on the back of this Brexit issue. And so even if you could find some kind of a technical solution, the the fact would remain that politically the border has changed its status and that's good enough for those people. Yeah. And so, you know, from, from that perspective, it's it's absolutely correct for the EU and the Irish side to insist on the backstop to avoid this change of status. Uh, So I would push this all the way. Um, The UK side has had three years to come up with alternative arrangements that would actually work. They don't exist and nobody will come up with them. We have lots of people coming out of the woodwork now at the last minute with some clever solution that turns out never to be a solution because other people would have thought about it uh, all the time, to- all along. Um, so that that is really the only way I think we're going to get to an agreed, uh, orderly uh, Brexit. And unfortunately, I think the the chances have for a long time now been uh, bigger that there is going to be a no deal Brexit. Yeah. And at the end of the day, and this is something that I think on the EU side uh, we have to realize, is that. The Brexiteers won the referendum and Brexit to them didn't mean a situation like Norway. Uh, It meant out, out of the single market, out of the customs union. So they won and it would be very unusual for them to have won and not get what they wanted. So basically... Boris Johnson's strategy is going to be really tough now. There's actually a possibility that he does not care whether it's a deal or no deal. Yeah. I, I mean, we can't look into his head, but uh, he, he, he has been so swathing about the EU for so long. I mean, he's, he's wrote some of the, 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 the crazy stories uh, about the EU that, that sort of fed the Eurosceptic yeah. uh, uh, base. There's a possibility he believes that stuff. Uh, there's a possibility that he really believes that the UK must leave and maybe without a deal is the best way to leave. I think he's very wrong because yeah. ultimately he wants a deal, a trade deal at some point with the EU and leaving on bad terms is just about the worst way to to get a, a basis for negotiations in the future. Uh, and again, that brings me back to what I said earlier about Theresa May and her confrontational approach. 
that is the worst way to get your way in the end. Yeah. So that's interesting. You mentioned the fact that he, he doesn't want to leave on bad terms and he's going about that the wrong way at the moment. But then there's also the fact that we have no infrastructure. You touched on that already. Well, minimal if when it comes to a, a no deal situation in Ireland and in the UK. But does that make it a no deal situation an impossibility in that, that if in if we knew now for certain that there's going to be no deal Brexit, we wouldn't have the infrastructure to do it. It would likely to be postponed the, until we do have the infrastructure. The the unpor- unfortunate thing is that there's also the the sort of blame game uh, that has to be played out, and that uh, that is where the EU and the Irish side don't want to be blamed for any border infrastructure yeah. by putting it up before it actually is necessary, okay. uh, and. That that then c- creates a vacuum, uh, I think, and I, I think it's 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 a mistake to go down that route. Uh, it doesn't really matter who the the English or British people blame uh, at the end. It doesn't really matter mm. uh, as long as the EU and the Irish side know who to blame. That is all that matters to us. Yeah. But they are worrying about who is going to put the blame on the mess in Britain. I wouldn't worry about that. They're going to be no longer a member of the EU and therefore a third country and not that relevant. Well, so one of the, so you mentioned before about the Brexiteers, um, they wanted a certain type of Brexit. But at the time of the referendum, it wasn't really clear what Brexit meant. So you have the sort of circular system where you have, as you were saying, you don't have a majority for anything, but you don't have a majority for Remain, you don't have a majority for hard Brexit, you don't, you don't have a majority for, for soft Brexit. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 one of the things about Brexit that I think most of us, me included, didn't realise is the complexity. Yeah. Uh, the EU and the relationships that we have with, with the the other EU countries are so uh, intense and so diverse. Actually, disentangling uh, oneself from that is very difficult. Yeah. And you come into, into the most peculiar areas of legislation where there are issues. Uh, and I think that wasn't understood at all. Uh, and I think... Um, within the the English establishment, Northern Ireland and the Irish border was really perceived as an issue at the time of the Brexit referendum. Uh, There were plenty of people who tried to bring that uh, to the debate. I I know I I spoke in in Northern Ireland and and also in in London before the referendum, tried to make the point that this is going to be an issue, but Mm. nobody was really that interested in Northern Ireland. Um, And and I think there were a lot of things or a lot of dimensions to Brexit that were not understood or ignored that if they had been understood by the public and if the public hadn't been misled by some uh, of the propaganda that we saw at the time in terms of the, the, the cost of the EU and so on, uh, they might have chosen a different path. Again, if you felt that that was a problem, then you could have held or could hold another referendum. Yeah. But of course, the Brexiteers won the day. They don't want to hold another referendum that overturns this result. Sure. They want this result. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so just to, in terms of the final section, maybe we'll just think about the, the potential impacts. I know you've done some research on, on in terms of household impacts. Maybe you could just give us an idea of, of, of some of the figures in that regard. Yeah. Um, so when we've looked a little bit, I mean, this is one of the things that, that uh, often puzzles me. Um, most countries, uh, Ireland included, um, seem to worry about Brexit in terms of exports. The UK is a large market. We export a lot to them. Uh, so that's that's where the problem is. But of course, we also import a lot from the UK. And Ireland is unique in that sense that when it comes to goods, uh, uh, we're, we're very significantly dependent on, on goods coming uh, uh, from the UK. So if we had a hard Brexit, we would have a tariff regime uh, because the UK would become a third country. And we already know the tariffs that the EU has registered with the WTO. So in the research that uh, I've done with a colleague at the Economic and Social Research Institute, Martina Lawless, we've looked at the impact of the imposition of these tariffs on 
prices. Yeah. And it's quite interesting. So the, the average uh, family or household would end up spending somewhere between 900 and 1400 euros more uh, uh, because of the tar- imposition of the tariffs. Now, of course, that's a static analysis. Yeah. If we bought the same goods uh, from other EU partners, then those tariffs wouldn't apply, yeah. but presumably higher transport costs would. So prices would definitely go up. Our estimates say somewhere between 2 and 3.1% with substitution to other goods from other EU countries. That would be a bit smaller, but it would definitely be noticeable. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So would, so this is at the household level in terms of your yeah. basket of goods and services. And, and what's interesting here is the types of goods that we receive from the UK are the types of goods... Uh, that are perhaps a bit more uh, uh, important in the in the basket of the poorer households, right. and of course, poorer households more generally spend more money on goods versus services, sure. uh, and so there's a distributional implication for households that the poorer households get hit much worse proportionally than the richer households. Right. Okay. And then we've done other analysis looking at the export side, and. Here we find that the, particularly the agri-food sector is vulnerable, but there are a few other sectors. For example, the, the wood, wood and wood products, over 80% of their exports go to the UK. Uh, and that's also where the tariffs are highest. If the UK reciprocated with a similar tariff, uh, then those sectors would be hit very badly. And of course, those sectors are regionally uh, distributed or most most frequently found in the, the poorer regions. So, uh, for example, in County Monaghan, one in five jobs is in agri-food. Yes. Uh, so if, if that sector gets hit because of tariffs, then you would expect that that, that county will suffer the worst. Uh, uh, that would be the immediate overnight effect if the border went up in the morning. I imagine as time goes on, they might dissipate and... and uh, there might be an adjustment. Yeah, and there, there, there are two different things happening. So initially you would have contracts in place. Uh, so you, you typically still want to fulfill your contracts and that binds you into into certain things. So if you're an exporter and you, you've, you've contracted to, to be paid in sterling, for example, you take the exchange rate risk. Um, that could be negative. Uh, but eventually these contracts are finished and then there'll be new contracts. And, and so those particular issues are resolved. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you have, you have established trading relationships uh, with producers or wholesalers in the UK yeah. and switching from those uh, uh, is not that easy. And likewise, if you're producing, say, a food product that is for the UK market, tastes are not the same everywhere in the EU. Sure. So selling this one product somewhere else is not necessarily easy. You're going to have to win shelf space in, in supermarkets, for example, which you, you, you can't easily do. Yeah. So switching is difficult. So that would suggest that the impact would be biggest fairly early on. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, over time would reduce as you ch- you find new uh, trading partners, new markets, uh, you sort out some of the logistics chain issues that that also going to face us. Sure. So over time, you would expect that impact to less. Uh, OK, so I think that seems to be it. Uh, Edgar, thank you very much. You're welcome.